questions today. I'm honored to introduce your keynote speaker. And to be honest, I'm not sure how to introduce the most famous young Hoosier there is. What I can simply say is that as I, as I traveled across the state this last year, as the first openly LGBTQ candidate for statewide office in Indiana, the reception, support, and enthusiasm for my candidacy was in no small part due to the historic efforts of Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg is the former two-term mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and was a Democratic candidate for president of the United States in 2020. He's a graduate of Harvard University and an Oxford Rhodes Scholar. Mayor Pete enlisted in the US Navy Reserve and became a lieutenant when he was deployed to Afghanistan in, 20, in 2014. And last year, in April 2019, he announced his candidacy for president and in February 2020, he won the Iowa caucuses, becoming the first openly gay person to ever win a presidential primary or caucus. It's not lost on me that Pete joins us this week on yet another week where the rights of us LGBTQ Americans were decided by the Supreme Court. Five times in the last 20 years, our rights were expanded not by legislative action, but by the court. That Pete took our fight to the race for president of the United States, among so many other democratic priorities, is testament to the courage and strength young Democrats bring to each and every race. Mayor Pete is and will forever be a favorite son of the Hoosier State. So before we hear from Pete, watch this historic moment for our state from his campaign in this video clip here. Take a look. It's good to be home. This campaign was built on an idea of hope, an idea of inclusion. We went out there with that one shot and we gave it everything we had because it is time for every single person in this country to look to the White House and know that that institution stands for them, that they belong in this country. It's an honor to come home and to bring home the person I love so dearly. So please help me welcome to the stage my dear husband, the man I love so much, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. It's so good to be in South Bend. Here we are. The last few years, America has faced enormous challenges. And so like so many others, I thought deeply about what I could do to make a difference, what I could do to make myself useful. And it was in that spirit, with your help, that a year ago, we launched our campaign for the American presidency. Hardly anybody knew my name and even fewer could pronounce it. But South Bend showed everybody what to do. First name Mayor, last name Pete. So nobody could Wisdom. We were able to see a little bit of that video there, but here coming up is Pete Buttigieg. Hi, it's Pete Buttigieg, and I'm so thankful for the chance to join you 
virtually but enthusiastically as we come together for the Indiana Young Democrats Convention and commit ourselves to support one another in the unbelievably historically important work of making sure that we elect Democrats up and down the ticket. As you know, I'm fresh off the experience of running for president and doing it as the youngest candidate in the field and the youngest candidate in quite some time to step forward. One of the things that I saw, not just in my own campaign, but in all of the conversations that we had with voters, with activists and advocates, with elected officials, with fellow Democrats and people that were calling over to our side, is that the longer you're planning to be here, the younger you are, the more you have at stake in a set of decisions that is about to be made that will reverberate through American history and certainly set the terms of what it will be like to live in America for the rest of our lives. I don't think it's a coincidence that so many of the most important actions and movements and steps uh, that we've seen in recent years and recent weeks have been largely led by young people. And we have to make sure that Indiana not only hears the call, but leads the way as I believe we're capable of. I'm sick of people knowing Indiana principally based on the vice president. We can do better. And you have been doing better by coming together to make sure that we elect great Democrats up and down the ticket. So no matter who you supported in this year's presidential primary, I want to thank you for your involvement. And I want to urge you to find new ways to take that advocacy forward. You know, the reality is the job of a candidate in this moment of the pandemic has changed, but it's only changed so much. They are still doing the work of speaking to issues, engaging with voters, raising resources, contacting the media. It's actually the rest of us, those who are supporting those candidates, who will have the most work to do in finding new ways in this moment to respond, to campaign, and to effectively support the people that we believe in. And if that already seemed critically important before, we now know that much more why it's indispensable. Our country is in a state of anguish over the police violence that has killed so many Black Americans, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, those killed not by police, but certainly in the context of races like Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others. We can no longer allow this to be viewed as an issue that will burden only those black activists and leaders of color who have been crying out about this for a lifetime. Of course, black voices are and should be leading the way. But this is a time for white Americans, white Hoosiers, white progressives to recognize our own role as allies, to step up, educate ourselves, and do a better job of supporting those who are standing for their own rights and for their own lives. I've been thinking a lot about the nature of allyship because of the extraordinary news that has come down from the Supreme Court. We knew that the Civil Rights Act protected LGBTQ Americans on a common sense reading, but that was not officially the law of the land. When the sun came up on Monday morning, it remained the case that in so many parts of America and so many parts of Indiana, it was perfectly legal to fire somebody because of who they are or who they love. That change, that extraordinary decision by the Supreme Court followed the leadership of so many activists and advocates, including the extraordinary leadership of black trans women and other activists 50 years ago, at a time when pride, as we now know it, had its roots largely in a response to police violence. The work of those activists and the work of straight allies made it possible for us to enjoy the enormous steps forward in LGBTQ equality that we have seen, even though we know that there's a long way to go. And so I think it's a time for anybody who is on the benefiting side of any kind of privilege, including the racial privilege that white people enjoy, to face what that means and recognize the obligation to step up and deliver the change that we all know needs to happen across the country. Meanwhile, 
our country has been brought to a near standstill by a pandemic that reminds us, like climate change, of just how much matters in making sure that our leaders respect science, let politics take a backseat to saving lives, understand the inequities and disparate impacts of these colossal challenges that come our way, and are ready to actually call us to do what is needed to get through a crisis together. Obviously, we don't have that, but we could, and we will, thanks to the work that you're doing. I've heard a lot of activists and advocates talk about the fact that this isn't just a matter of getting the right candidates and the right elected officials in. It's not just about voting. And that's correct. I agree. At the same time, we know that these changes won't happen unless we do get out and vote, protect the vote, support those candidates whose values around justice, around a progressive vision of what freedom and what democracy and what security mean. If they're sure those candidates are elected to office. As President Obama said recently, at the end of the day, this is about making sure that specific practices and institutions change. In democracy, our moment of greatest empowerment to make sure that that happens is election day. Of course, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, speaking to the young Democrats about this issue. But I want to urge you to stay strong in your outreach to others who, for very understandable reasons, have come to question whether the institutions and the political system of our country are capable of delivering real change. They are capable, but only if we insist that they are. And that's the work that you're doing and that all of us are doing in order to make sure that we have unity and inclusion, driving greater equality and the right kinds of outcomes with the right kinds of leaders in this country. So much depends on this upcoming November. It won't solve all of our problems, but it will radically change our ability to face them. And I think it's also time to send a message around the country that there is no such thing as a permanently red district or community or state. We could send such a powerful message by getting more Democrats elected here in the state of Indiana, again, up and down the ticket. And when we do, people will take note. I've seen it happen. I've seen how even people who used to think of themselves as Republicans recognize that they can no longer be on board with the cruelty, with the division, even the hatred that emanates from and is condoned by this White House. This is a once in a generation opportunity for us to realign American politics, to make sure that our values, progressive values, which are also deeply American values, carry the day and win the era. That's why I've always believed that elections are not just about winning an office, but winning an era to come. I believe that the 2020s are going to be remembered for setting the tone for what the years and decades that we will live the rest of our lives in are going to be like. And all of that begins with this 2020 election. I guess what I'm saying is for the younger generations involved in politics today, there is tremendous pressure and a tremendous burden, but also an unbelievable opportunity to decisively shape American life for the years and decades to come. And I hope you never underestimate the moral authority that you have as young Americans, as young Hoosiers, looking in the eye elected officials demanding that they do a better job of providing for greater racial and economic justice and equality, of ensuring that the climate is one that you and the generations to follow can actually thrive in, of protecting you and your neighborhoods and your schools and your communities from gun violence. On issue after issue after issue, the mere fact of looking into the eyes of a young voter or a young person not even yet old enough to vote can change perspectives. I saw it happen when we succeeded in counties in Iowa that reminded me of Indiana that had voted for Barack Obama and then voted for Donald Trump and now were ready to move in the right direction. And the advocacy and the activism that, but, but most of all the vocabulary, the sensibility that you have 
because you were in the trenches in a so-called red state, fighting not only for your friends and your allies, but for your lives in so many ways. That's what's going to bring about real change. It's the only thing that ever has. And I support you every step of the way. I want to thank you for what you're doing, especially when you come from a community where it can be tough sledding to be a Democrat. There are so many more of us than is known. And as we stand together and make our voice heard, protect the vote and turn out the vote, we're going to have a lot of reason to celebrate in November. And then we're going to have a huge amount of work to do. Because all of the debating that played out in the primaries over exactly how to meet these goals, how to deliver racial justice, how to fundamentally change the culture of policing in this country, how to make sure that we meet those urgent deadlines around our climate that are being set not by politicians, but by science, how we raise wages and empower workers in this country, how we support public education. We're going to have those debates again over how exactly to get that right. But the questions that are being settled in November aren't about how to do those things. They're about whether to do those things. It's about whether this country will be pulled together or pulled apart. It's about whether climate change must be acted on or whether we'll continue to prevent, pretend that it's a hoax. It's about whether racial and economic justice will actually be taken seriously in this country, whether this country will do anything meaningful to demonstrate that black lives matter and are valued equally across the land. Those are the questions that are about to be settled in this upcoming election. And we have a chance to make sure that they are answered in a way that we'll be proud of when we are speaking to future generations about what it was like to be alive and involved at the dawn of the 2020s. That's the opportunity. That's why I'm proud to be standing with you. And that's why it's going to feel so good when we celebrate the fruits of all the hard, hard work that you are doing and that you are about to be doing for all of the days between here and election day. I can't wait to visit with you and spend time with you in person again. But in the meantime, from here in South Bend, I'm sending you all of my warmest greetings, my strongest encouragement, and my deepest thanks. Take care, stay well, and stay involved.